Get my six. Ah, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Homesteading Off the Grid, the most popular homesteading channel on the entire internet that has absolutely nothing to do with homesteading. So here we are, just inside the edge of the woods, where forest meets field. We're at elevation on a hill. It's almost dark, and there's water, there's moisture, there's rain. Thank God for this precious rain. It's been dry around here this summer. We've got mist. This means the veil is thin. And what better time? Oh, we're getting closer to Halloween too. It's coming next month when the veil is thinnest. No better time for a spooky, creepy ghost story, okay? This is one that was submitted to us anonymously for the upcoming True Hauntings Volume 4. By the way, guys and girls, if you've got a story, send it to us. We're about five stories away from being able to do final edits and go to print to get True Hauntings Volume 4 out in time for October. And I'll share a lot of those stories with you during October for the October Night's Tales. Uh, if you've got a story, something creepy, spooky, supernatural, cryptozoological, UFO, aliens, whatever, that happened to you or someone you know, uh, a thousand words or less, email it to us at crazylake at mail.com. Crazylake at mail.com. Now, before I get into this story, I'm going to read you another one, which is basically a comment that somebody left on one of the uh, videos I've made recently talking about how the public schools have just gone so far downhill because they no longer educate core curriculum. They indoctrinate social issues. Um, this this is terrifying, and it's something I think that needs to be looked at. You know, you hear about these little tiny kids coming to school, identifying as this, identifying as that, and we're being told that if you don't say, oh, yeah, okay, sure, you can be a, a, a bird. We'll build you a bird's nest for you to sit in during class. Or, yeah, we'll put litter boxes in the bathrooms because you identify as a kitty cat. We're told that if we question this, that if we think maybe there might be something going on in that kid's life or maybe there's a mental health issue that we're bigots, we're bigoted. We're supposed to just take everything at face value as far as people identifying as things they clearly are not. Otherwise, we're bigots. Folks, you need to hear this story, and I gotta put on my old man glasses for this. This was submitted, uh, shoot, I, I read, last name was Reed, I know that. Catherine Reed, I believe. I didn't put the name on here when I printed off the comment. <clears throat> this story goes back to 1982 when this nonsense didn't exist, okay? Uh, and this shows the importance of cutting through the nonsense. 1982, Tampa, Florida Public School. My daughter's kindergarten teacher called me and said my five-year-old was sitting under her table and barking like a dog. My daughter insisted that she was a dog. So here's her five-year-old identifying as a dog. Now, of course, if this happened in the public schools today, they'd probably give the child a, or the puppy rather, don't, I don't want to sound like a bigot. They'd give the puppy a little, probably one of those dog homes with a doggy dish with their food and the doggy dish for water and maybe something like a kitty litter box to use a restroom. But this was 1982 when such shenanigans didn't exist, okay? So, uh, but my daughter wasn't being disruptive in any other way. The teacher, a wise woman, called to alert me. When my daughter came home, we talked. She did bark a few times, but said she was a dog. I explained she cannot be a dog while in school. That pacified it for a bit. A few days later, while eating supper, she started to climb on her seat and lick the soup out of her bowl. Enough, I said. No more dog. You're my little girl, and I want you to be my little girl. If I wanted, do wanted a dog, I would get a dog. Her reply was, then how can I protect us? That led to a long talk. Listen closely, folks. The month before this behavior, our apartment was broken into twice. Last time, we were home asleep. She felt if she was a dog, she could protect us. Imagine, if we went along with her identity, put a collar and walked her on a leash, imagine if school supported her identity and allowed her to sit on the floor for the remainder of the year, bark out answers and crawl to the playground. Children create a world in their imagination that most times are influenced by the reality, these events happening around them. Do you realize how powerful this message is? This is probably the most powerful message you will ever hear in regard to little kids identifying as things that they are not. This little girl experienced trauma and she was scared. She was scared in her own home, which is the place where we should all be able to feel safest because her home had been burglarized, broken into twice in one month, the second time of which the family was home and asleep. It could have been much worse. 
had that teacher not had common sense and alerted the mother, and if the mother had not had common sense, if those two women had not said, okay, there's something unnatural about a child identifying as an, as an animal and question that, they never would have gotten to the root of the issues behind why this little girl was doing that. What sort of long-term, lifelong mental health effects would they have had by allowing her to continue to identify as a dog? They would have never gotten to the root of the problem. Think about that, people. Think about it. Okay, with no further ado, as my beautiful bride dearly, a.k.a. Giggly Girl, would say, I'm going to read you the story. I'm trying to get away from this heart attack serious stuff. Um, that's not what this channel is typically about. But that was something going on in our lives, and I wanted to share with you folks. And if you got stories about that, send them in in the comment section. I'll share them here. I need to make people aware. Need to wake people up. People need to be awake. That's the proper term, folks. All right. So this story is called on, or it's called Unhollowed Ground, okay? Hi, Kevin. I love your YouTube channel, Homesteading Off the Grid. It really is the best homesteading channel on the internet that has nothing to do with homesteading. And when I need a laugh, I check out your Facebook page, Sick Twisted Humor. I love your jokes, and I have no idea how you're able to tell them while keeping a straight face. You have my permission to use my story in any way you like. I simply ask that you keep me anonymous. I'm not concerned with people thinking I'm nuts. Like you, I'm 50-ish, and I stopped caring what people thought about me years ago, if I ever cared. But I want to remain anonymous for my family's safety. This story came out locally about 20 years ago, and we had people coming from several states away to trespass on our property to go ghost hunting, and it took more effort than we cared to put into it to get it to stop, and I don't want a repeat experience of that. My family and I live on 50 acres in southwestern Pennsylvania. If you were to go outside and look at the place, you would think you were on your homestead in Virginia. The lay of the land is almost identical, though I'm sure our winters are more brutal than yours. My parents actually bought the land when I was a little girl in the 1970s. There was no house. It had originally been part of a much larger farm that was being sold off piecemeal so that the boomers who inherited it at the time could satisfy estate taxes. We were living in town, and it was my parents' dream to build our house on the land, which they eventually did, and they wanted to make sure that the house was built in the perfect spot. We had a pop-up camper that we would haul out to the land literally like every weekend and holiday. We would pull it behind our old station wagon, the station wagon itself loaded down with all the food and supplies we'd need. Anyway, there was a really beautiful spot on top of the property with a commanding view of the entire property as it sprawled out below. It was a lot like your campground on your property where you make so many of your corny videos. Sorry. Urgh. Every time we would visit this spot, we would literally feel the temperature drop by at least 10 degrees. I mean, it was that noticeable. And it didn't matter what time of year or day or night it was. And the temperature never rose here, which is more than more the norm as heat drafts rise. We should build here, my brother and I would say every time we went up there. And my parents, almost in unison, would always say, I don't know. And they looked really nervous when we were up there. And they always wanted to leave. We never did stay at this part of the property long, despite the view it gave. Fast forward to fall, that's when things got really weird, especially the closer we got to Halloween. For one thing, this is the first time we noticed the wildlife, rather their reaction to the place. Of all the deer, rabbits, foxes, squirrels, turkeys, and occasionally bears we saw on the property, and there were plenty, we never saw any on this high spot. Further, the place was covered with mature oaks which produced hordes of acorns, which as I'm sure you know is deer's favorite food in the fall. The deer never went up there and touched them, and there were wild grapevines which produced hordes of wild grapes, which as you probably know is a favorite of turkeys. We watched one morning as a flock of what had to be 40 turkeys fed around the knoll and never went up to get the grapes. Squirrels, they left the acorns alone, the same as the deer. The following year, my parents had finally saved up enough money to break ground for the house. Despite their guts telling them not to do so, they did choose the knoll as the building site. This is what happened. When the dozers began excavating, they uncovered no less than a dozen skeletons. They'd been buried in a mass grave. 
<sighs> I'm getting chills because I know where the story goes. <clears throat> Kevin, all of a sudden it made sense to us. Why the temperature dropped. Why the wildlife avoided the area. Why my parents always got a creepy feeling and didn't really want to build on this site. Forensics came out, and after realizing just how old the bones were, they decided not to spend any more time. It was a cold case, as in literally hundreds of years old. There were no remains of any current missing people, and obviously whoever had done whatever they'd done to these poor souls was long dead as well, so the forensics simply didn't see investigating any farther. I remember my dad pleading with a couple of the people to at least give him their best hypothesis on what was going on. They stayed for an extra 10 minutes, and what they told us was this. All of the skeletal remains appeared to be female. They appeared to be aged 16 to 30 years. They appeared to be more than 200 years old, and perhaps even as old as 300 years. The skulls indicated that there were at least three distinct races represented, Asian, Caucasian, and African or African American. Kevin, I was standing there when one of those two men looked up at my dad and said, quote, Sir, I believe you may have found the remains of the victims of a pre-revolutionary serial killer. I get chills even writing these words. I get chills even reading them. Needless to say, we built the house on the far end of the property, as far away from the site as we could get. My parents are both dead now and were actually renting out their old house. My husband and I built ours a couple hundred yards away from theirs back in the late 90s, shortly after we got married. But trust me, we made sure to stay far away from that knoll. In wrapping this up, I want to point this out. People who don't believe in the paranormal and or the supernatural can make fun of those of us who do all they want. But there is no way to deny the activity we witnessed around this site. Rather, the lack of activity, the wildlife avoiding the area, etc., is very real and it is very observable. Kevin, I do believe there is a veil. It is right in front of us and so few can see it. However, there are things that do slip in and out of it, especially the closer we get to Halloween. Again, you have my permission to share this story. Just please, again, keep me anonymous. Keep up the great work you do with social media. You at least entertain me, but obviously with more than 1 million total followers and subscribers now, you've clearly, you're clearly entertaining a lot of others as well. Best wishes. Anonymous. Whew, what a creepy story. But again, not as scary as some of the reasons some of these little children are identifying as things other than human and the fact that society wants to gloss over it and just say, okay, at face value out of the fear of being called a bigot because that's the times we live in. All right, folks. Again, we need about five more submissions to go to final edits and print for True Hauntings Volume 4. If you got a story, send it in. Okay, and we will see you for more next time.